John Steinbeck of Mice and Men, Section 4. We begin on page 66. This section begins with a discussion of the room where Crooks lives. We have already been introduced to the character when we heard the other characters actually talking about him. Unfortunately, the descriptions of him are negative and the reader is forced to be prejudiced to him in a negative way. Now we hear of the poor conditions of his abode. The first sentence states that Crooks is a stable buck. This in itself is a racist term and a derogatory way of describing African American. Crooks is presented as a lonely figure. He has a physical disability that makes him worry that he will soon no longer be useful on the ranch. His isolation is made worse by the fact that as a black man, he is assigned to sleep in the harness room within the stables. He is not allowed in the white ranch hands quarters and is not invited to play cards or go into town with the other men. He has become a bitter character due to his isolation. Slavery might have been abolished in 1865. However, racism is still accepted in society and Crooks is still treated like a slave. He had to contend with living in a little, little shed that was attached to the barn. There was only one window in the little room and we see the description um, actually around here. On one side of the little room, there was a square four-paned window and on the other, a narrow plank door leading to the barn. Crook's bunk was a long box filled with straw. He was not even afforded a proper bed with a mattress, but had to sleep in a box with a straw in it like an animal. Crook's is being presented as less than human. He had to share his room with the tools of his work. And we see um, actually the description in the middle part of the page. Broken harness, in process of being mended, bench for leather, working tools. Crooks had his apple box over his bunk and in it a range of medicine bottles for both himself and for the horses. Notice that both medicines are actually blended together, uh, human and, um, and horses. We move on to page 67. As a permanent employee, due to being a stable buck and a cripple, he had more possessions, shoes, boots, alarm clock and even single-barreled shotgun perhaps the need to protect himself. He also has books. There's a dictionary, California Civil Code for 1905, and magazines. Along with his gold-rimmed spectacles, this is all suggesting that Crooks is an educated person. The fact that he is reading a book of law, which is out of date and not relevant anymore, suggests that he wants to do better for himself. So this is what Steinbeck is actually suggesting, that Crooks is intelligent, he wants to do better. However, because he was fated as a black man, therefore he will not achieve this reality, he will not achieve his dream. And if you look at this quote in the middle of the page, in the stable buck's room, a small electric globe threw a meagre yellow light. These words show the depressing atmosphere in which Crooks lived. Turn now to page 68. Lenny, in his innocence, walks into Crook's room, looking for someone to talk to as George had gone into town with the boys. Now think about this aspect. Not long ago, George said he wanted to save money uh, for the farm and they needed all that extra money to purchase it. And now he has decided to go into town and spend his money. Crooks is surprised by Lenny's entrance and reacts in an angry way. And we can see that at the beginning of the page. This here's my room. Nobody got any right in here but me. You go on and get out of my room. I ain't wanted in the bunkhouse and you ain't wanted in my room. Lenny, in his childlike innocence, asks, Why ain't you wanted? Lenny, with his childlike mind, does not understand social norm, nor does he understand discrimination or racism. Crooks retorts, "'Cause I'm black. They say I stink. Well, I tell you, you all of you stink to me." And that's the bit up here. It is probable to say that Crooks is surprised at Lenny's question, considering that racial discrimination is so prevalent in society 
and yet Lenny is asking such a question as why. Crooks becomes intrigued by Lenny and asks why he has come into the barn. Lenny replies to see the pup. However, as he mentioned that everybody went into town and he saw Crook's light, it is fair to assume that Lenny wanted company, someone to talk to. Lenny is lonely and is searching for a friend. He has no idea of racism as his childlike state inhibits him from such knowledge. Racism is a learned trait, be it deliberately taught or through observance of the world around. It is learned as children grow older. Mentally, Lenny has never grown older. And we look back onto page now 69. Lenny's conversation with Crooks continues as we find out that all the men went to town except for Candy, who was sitting in the bunkhouse. And the quote here, sharpening his pencil and sharpening and figuring. We know that Candy is busy working out how to purchase and run the farm that he is going to have with George and Lenny. Candy has gone from depression after losing his dog to hope after agreeing to purchase the farm. Lenny becomes a source of entertainment to Crooks as he talks about the rabbits. Crooks calls him crazy as Lenny explains, It ain't no lie, I'm gonna do it, gonna get a little place and live on the fat of the land. Just like a child, Lenny has forgotten to keep the farm a secret and not talk about it. And this is the quote where he mentions it. So we turn now to page 71. Crooks realises why George travels with Lenny. It doesn't matter that Lenny doesn't make sense. It's just being with another guy, that's all. And that's the quote up here, that being with another guy. The reader senses that Crooks is envious of the relationship between George and Lenny. They have something valuable, a friendship during a time when most of the guys are alone. They have someone to talk to. They have each other. Crooks then begins to taunt Lenny. Suppose George don't come back no more. We see a different side of Crooks here as he begins to cruelly suggest that George will not come back. He continues to enjoy torturing Lenny almost delighting in seeing Lenny become more and more upset at the thought until Lenny becomes angry, walks dangerously close to Crooks and threatens him. Who hurt George? And we see that towards the end here. Notice that Crooks' face lighted with pleasure in his torture of Lenny. And that's that quote in the middle of the page. Crooks continues... And I'm looking at this part of the page. Want me to tell you what'll happen? They'll take you to the booby hatch, meaning the mental asylum. They'll tie you up with a collar like a dog. George is quite aware if he leaves Lenny, then the repercussions would be severe. He knows the horrific conditions Lenny will have to live in and the abhorrent treatments he would be forced to endure if George does not look after him. Without George... Lenny could not survive on his own in society. Crooks is delighting in taunting Lenny. For someone who is constantly on the outer of society with everyone having power over him, he has finally found someone who is beneath him and over whom he has power. Steinbeck's message is that if you are downtrodden and mistreated, then you want to exert power over someone who is inferior to you. Crooks is a victim of his society and in this scenario he has become a perpetrator of the same kind of evil upon someone else, someone who cannot defend himself. This section shows that in the ranch hands world not only will the strong attack the weak but the weak will attack the weaker. And we move on to page 72. After pacifying a distraught Lenny, Crooks vents about his state of desperation and loneliness and it is this middle section that you need to have a, a good look at. Maybe you can see now, you got George. You know he's going to come back. Suppose you didn't have nobody. Suppose you couldn't go into the bunkhouse and play rummy because you was black. How do you like that? Suppose you had to sit out here and read books. 
Sure, you could play horseshoes till it got dark, but then you got to read books. Books ain't no good. A guy needs somebody to be near him. He whined. A guy goes nuts if he ain't got no body. Don't make no difference who the guy is as long as he's with you. I tell you, he cried. I tell you, a guy gets too lonely and he gets sick. In section one, George actually says the same thing. Guys get sick when they're alone. And he even says to Lenny that guy, you know, guys like you and I are, are the loneliest people in the world. So this idea of loneliness, again, comes back through the novel. Steinbeck is criticising the American society of the 1930s. Because of the Depression and Dust Bowls, workers had to move around looking for work. There was no ability or opportunities to form long-standing relationships, therefore people were isolated and suffered as a result. And we move on to page 73. Here the reader sees both Lenny and Crooks talking. However, they are not talking to each other. They are both talking about their own thing, their own dream. Lenny continues talking about the rabbits and the dream of owning the farm. Crooks dismisses his ideas. He says he has seen lots of guys come to the farm with their bindles, work for a while and then quit. And um, there's a quote just down the bottom of the page. They come and they quit and go on and every damn one of them's got a little piece of land in his head and never a goddamn one of them ever gets it, just like heaven. Crooks is pointing out the futility of the dream. Everyone wants the same thing, land of their own, but no one will ever achieve it. Same as getting to heaven, it's unachievable. And if we look at page 74, Candy appears here and is looking for Lenny. He admits that although he and Crooks have both been at the farm for a long time, this is the first time Candy has entered Crook's room. And now on page 75. Candy talks to Lenny about the farm and that he has figured out how to earn some money by breeding rabbits. Crooks continues to tell them that they are both crazy and merely wasting their time, as their dream will never come to fruition. Steinbeck again is making a point that the American dream is futile, as most people will not achieve it. We turn now to page 76. The message continues that the reality of the economic crisis means that people will never achieve their dreams no matter how small they are or how hard they work to achieve it. Crooks asks if they even have the money to purchase the property. Candy replies that not only do they have the money, but they have the land picked out as well. Crooks, at this stage, realises that maybe these guys might achieve what no one else has and offers his services to join their dream. Unfortunately, Curly's wife appears and interrupts the men's dream. Again, she is looking for Curly, although later she admits that she knows that they went into town. Candy and Crooks both tell her to leave as Curly is not there. We turn to page 77. Curly's wife admits that she is lonely. And this is the quote that I'm looking at up here. Think I don't like to talk to somebody ever, once in a while? Think I like to stick in that house all the time? She then admits to having an unhappy marriage, as Curly is constantly talking about who he's going to beat up. He also leaves her at home whilst he goes and enjoys himself in town. Curly's wife then asks about her husband's hand. Candy explains that he got it caught in a machine. However, his wife does not believe it. And we move on to page 78. Curly's wife continues to talk about herself, even though the men prefer she leaves. She admits that she must be desperate to want to talk to the likes of Crooks, Lenny and Candy. But there is no one else around. And the quote that I'm looking at is up in here, the top of the page. Everybody out doing something, and what am I doing? Standing here talking to a bunch of bindle stiffs. A nigger 
and a dum-dum and a lousy old sheep and liken it because there ain't nobody else. In this way, she draws the attention to each man's weakness and shows why they are ostracised by society and also shows why they are left behind by all the other men who actually went into town. Curly's wife is also on the outer of society. She is a woman, lonely and in an unhappy marriage. Instead of unifying with the others, she seeks out their individual weaknesses and attacks them. Curly's wife continues to explain her dream. And a guy told me he could put me in pictures. The movie industry in the 1930s was dominated by men and the only way to get into that industry was to have the assistance of a man. We look on page 79. Crooks finally is fed up and tells Curly's wife to leave or he will tell the boss about her coming to the men's quarters. And we move on to page 80. Curly's wife does not take too kindly to being threatened by someone who in society is inferior to her. And her quote up here that I'm reading. Listen, nigger, she said. You know what I can do to you if you open your trap. The implication here is that she has the power to cause crooks a great deal of harm. The word of a white woman is more believable, even if she is lying. Curly's wife is showing her dominance in this situation. Even though she is a woman among men, because she is white, she is able to dominate crooks. Therefore, instead of defending himself, he responds by seeming to grow smaller. I'm up here. And he pressed himself against the wall. Yes, ma'am. And his voice was toneless. Crooks is a black man in a racist society. His physical disability mirrors his social disability. And I'm going to look at page 82. The men come back and George rebukes Candy for telling Crooks about the farm. Crooks changes his mind about joining their farm. He realises that it is futile for him to achieve such a dream. He went back to what he was doing at the start of the section. He returns back to the situation he was in at the beginning. He feels it is safer for him to live in his reality, albeit a difficult one, instead of pursuing a dream which is unattainable. And that is the end of section four.